South Korea, Seoul, 1995. It's a hot summer day in this booming capital city. In less than a decade, the country has transformed itself into one of the world's largest economies. The sudden wealth has led to a massive increase in construction. In Seoul, at least 10 high-rise buildings go up every week. But a shadow looms over this nation. Its neighbor, North Korea, lies just 25 miles from the capital. Close enough to put Seoul within range of artillery shells from one of the last surviving hardline communist countries. The relationship between the two has been violent for a long time. In 1983, North Korean militants detonated a bomb, killing 17 South Korean officials. Four years later, the communists are accused of destroying a South Korean airliner in flight, killing 115. June 29th, 7 a.m. Seoul's 10 million residents start another busy day. Among them is 19-year-old Park Seng Hyun. Park's dream is to be a school teacher. So to pay for her tuition, she works as a shop assistant. This evening, Park plans to meet her best friend So Hee Jin. The two women have known each other since they were four. Park was like a sister to me. She was very outgoing and very kind. We had planned to meet in a coffee shop after she finished work. Park works in the Sampung Superstore, one of the most exclusive retail outlets in South Korea. The building employs 1,000 staff and serves 40,000 customers every day. It turns over the equivalent of 4 million US dollars a week and sells everything from the latest electronics to designer fashion. Built in the late 80s from reinforced concrete, the complex has four basement levels and five stories above ground. It stands on nearly four acres of real estate in the city's exclusive Keng Nam district. The area was once a landfill site and the city's waste dump. Now it's one of Seoul's most affluent areas. 8.05 a.m. Young Cho Lee, the store's facility manager, starts his day. His first job is to investigate a note left on his desk by the nighttime security guard. In the early hours of the morning, the guard heard strange noises coming from the roof. The roof is cracked, but Lee knows that this was caused when air conditioning units were moved two years ago. Building safety is a major concern in South Korea. The country has recently been shocked by several tragedies. Two gas explosions and a bridge collapse have killed nearly 150 people. In all three cases, poor building practices were to blame. In the aftermath, the nation starts to question the price of their economic growth. So the state puts into place a series of rigorous inspections for all public buildings to restore confidence. Sampung has just passed its regular safety inspection. 10.02 a.m. Park is already busy at work in the children's clothing department. Over in the household section, Yu Ji Wan is running late. This is her first job since leaving school. And like most teenagers, she'd much rather be doing something else. Being a sales assistant is boring. It's tiring standing for so many hours. Park and Yu work on the same floor, basement level one. Five stories above them, on the top floor, there are eight restaurants. One of these is the Chun Wan restaurant. 
It's popular for its traditional Korean dishes. Inside, facility manager Mr. Lee is dealing with another problem. A large crack has appeared around one of the columns, and the floor looks buckled at the base. Lee decides to close the restaurant. Construction signs are put up, and access to the area is blocked off. Gossip spreads quickly in Sampong, so Lee cautions the restaurant's workers to say nothing. As midday approaches, the store gets busy. Then, customers on the fifth floor hear a disturbing sound. Once again, Mr. Lee goes to investigate. Down in basement level one, Yu starts to feel the building vibrate. Maybe I'm a bit foolish, but I didn't sense that anything was wrong. 12.30 p.m. Mr. Lee thinks that the air conditioning units may be causing the vibrations, so he turns off the air conditioning for the entire building. An announcement is made telling shoppers the air conditioning is under repair and will be turned off for the rest of the day. As the temperature reaches nearly 80 degrees Fahrenheit, shoppers start to complain. Customers are getting angry. Why doesn't a prestigious store like Sampung have working air conditioning? 4 p.m. Behind the scenes, facility manager Mr. Lee briefs the superstore's owner about the cracks in the restaurant, which have widened to four inches since the morning. Also present is Hawk Su Lee, the structural engineer. Su Lee built the complex, and he recommends closing the store for urgent repairs. The owner refuses. He's adamant that the stores stay open for shopping to continue. Beneath the restaurants on the fifth floor, workers are worried that something is seriously wrong. Facility manager Mr. Lee attempts to reassure the staff. But rumors that the building has a problem are spreading. 5.40 p.m. A loud bang is heard from the top floor. This time, the ceiling shifts. Unknown to Park, you, and more than 1,500 other people, the building is on the verge of catastrophe. Shoppers and staff at the Sampung department store have been hearing loud bangs coming from the top floor. Rumors are rife that the building is in trouble. It's 5.45 p.m., and the complex is packed with shoppers. With no working air conditioning, Park Sing Hyun is suffering from the heat. The temperature has reached nearly 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Household department assistant Yu Ji Wan is also overheating. She goes to the restroom. Washing my face and arms in cold water is all I can do to keep myself cool. Then, at 5.47 p.m., another, even louder bang roars out from the top floor. But five stories below, you and her co-workers feel nothing. At 5.52 and 30 seconds, a massive shockwave rocks the entire building. Emergency alarms go off. On the upper floors, staff and customers panic and run for the exits. In the basement, Yu Ji Wan realizes something is seriously wrong. Suddenly, I hear a loud boom sound in the distance.
The sound gets closer and closer. And now the building is shaking. The five-story superstore starts to crumble. Park and you are engulfed in the mayhem. In less than 20 seconds, the building crashes to the ground. As the dust settles, it becomes clear the entire superstore has collapsed. What was once a symbol of Seoul's economic prosperity is now just a massive pile of twisted steel and concrete. Smoke seeps from the wreckage and 1,500 people are trapped. Within minutes, rescue teams, police and fire crews drag the dead and injured free of the wreckage. Television crews broadcast the tragedy live to the nation. South Korea has never witnessed a peacetime tragedy on this scale before. The death toll will be massive. The disaster site is a scene of utter chaos. Grief-stricken relatives and friends search for survivors. Among them is Park's lifelong friend, Sohee Jin. The two were supposed to meet this evening. I was shocked. So many injured and bleeding. The dead being carried away. So knows that her best friend must be somewhere in the rubble. I start scrambling at the rubble with my hands. I keep digging. I don't know why I'm doing it. I just need to do something. Almost 35 feet below So, underneath thousands of tons of debris, is all that's left of basement level one. There, in a space half the size of a telephone booth, lies Yu Ji Wan. She's badly injured, but incredibly still alive. I can feel a hole in my head, so large my finger can go through it. That's how big it is. And I can feel something squiggly in a cut on my back, like my intestine. I don't want to die. The scale of the rescue operation is massive. 1,000 rescue workers and volunteers desperately try to free bodies from the wreckage. By nightfall, more than 30 cranes and excavators are on site to speed up the rescue. They work through the night, carefully removing huge slabs of debris. By morning, more than 200 people are rescued. But 44 are dead, and more than 600 others are missing. Thousands of tons of concrete and steel hang dangerously over the site. Many bravely risk their lives to free victims. The north face of the building is tilting and could fall at any moment. By the end of the second day, the danger is just too great, and officials are forced to abandon the search for survivors. More than 500 relatives take to the street, pleading with officials to resume the rescue. In the protests, fights break out with riot police. Calling off the search now would be a death sentence for you and countless others trapped in the wreckage. 
You're watching Seconds from Disaster. A massive rescue effort stalls at the site where the San Pung Superstore once stood. Relatives demand that the search continue. By the morning of the third day, engineers stabilize the north wing with cables and the rescue operation continues. For Yu Ji Wan, trapped for over 72 hours, her chances of survival are dwindling. I think a lot about the short life I have had. All of those close to me, my friends, and especially my mother. <laughs> Relatives gather daily to identify the corpses pulled from the wreckage. Park Sing Hyung's friend So is there. She sees a photo that strikes fear in her heart. The picture shows a decapitated corpse. It is wearing the same ring Park had on. I pray it's not her. But at the hospital, she discovers the ring is different. It's not her friends. It's so good when I realize it isn't Park. I know she could still be alive. On day four, the death toll reaches 107. And rescue workers know many more are missing. The rubble is constantly compressing, crushing those still trapped inside. The wall above you is now just inches from her face. By chance, she finds a knife beside her. I think about killing myself. I can't take the horror anymore. But then I realized that actually it's easy to become very selfish and not think of the effect it would have on the people I love. Day after day passes and body after crushed body is found. Then after a full week, authorities decide there is little hope. Without water, a person can only survive for about three days in 85 degree heat. For relatives, the announcement is devastating. The rescue effort turns into a recovery operation. Heavy machinery moves in to clear the tons of rubble from the disaster site. Another five days go by and nearly 21,000 tons of wreckage has been cleared. Then, just after 3.30 in the afternoon, 12 days after the collapse, there's an astonishing discovery. Around where my foot was, suddenly it just opened up. There was a hole. Yu Ji Wan is found alive. And I can hear a voice asking, is there someone in there? Yu has survived in a space barely larger than her body. She has spent 285 hours trapped in searing heat, drinking rainwater to stay alive. I can't really explain it, but it's just happiness. I feel like I'm flying, that I'm freed from everything. Everyone knows who I am, and even if I die now, everything I've worried about has been taken away. Yu is rushed to the hospital and put into intensive care. She has lost more than 10% of her body weight, but her injuries are relatively minor. In total, 937 people are seriously injured. 502 have perished. Grief turns to anger. 
Why did a modern reinforced concrete building that stood for over six years collapse? What kind of catastrophe could raise it to the ground in less than 20 seconds? And who, if anyone, is to blame? Now, by rewinding the events of that day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal exactly what caused the worst building collapse in South Korea's history. Within an hour of the disaster, the prosecution office orders a full-scale inquiry. And there's only one man for the job. Long Chong is the professor of civil and structural engineering at Dan Guk University. His knowledge of South Korea's construction industry is unsurpassed. But as Professor Chung arrives at the disaster site, even he isn't prepared for what he sees. It's impossible to describe what I feel. So many people are crushed in the rubble. It's a huge shock. Chung knows that to cause this level of destruction, something devastating must have happened. I've never seen a building collapse so completely. It's utter chaos. He resists the urge to jump to conclusions, but one theory seems fitting right away. Sam Poon could be the latest gas-related disaster. In the last eight months, South Korea has been rocked by two massive explosions caused by leaking gas. The most recent was at Daegu subway in Seoul. The blast killed over 100 people and injured 140. The scenes look all too familiar. I'm 80 to 90 percent sure a gas explosion is responsible for this disaster. Chung knows one thing will prove if gas is to blame. Fire. Gas explosions have a distinct signature they almost always produce an inferno. But although parts of the building are ablaze, thick smoke isn't the evidence Chung needs. The fire is not from the blast, but from gasoline burning in the cars that have been crushed in the basement. Unable for now to prove the gas theory, Professor Chung considers a more sinister cause, a terrorist bomb. An explosion damaging the interior columns of the building could have caused this. North Korean militants are the obvious suspects. Two previous bombings have killed 136 innocent people. But a terrorist attack in the heart of the capital would be a horrifying new strategy. Investigator Long Chong is trying to determine if the disaster at the Sampung Superstore was caused by a terrorist bomb. It bears a striking resemblance to another shocking event in the U.S. On April 19, 1995, just 10 weeks prior, a terrorist bomb blew up the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. 168 people were murdered. Could the disaster at the Superstore be a similar case, where a bomb triggers a large-scale collapse? The two buildings were of similar construction, so is there anything to learn from the U.S. investigation? One of the first things I try to do is imagine how the collapse progressed, how the building got from a state standing up, ordinary state, down to a pile of rubble on the ground. Glenn Bell has been a structural engineer for 30 years. He has investigated many high-profile building disasters, including the Oklahoma bombing. A bomb explosion has its own unique mark. A footprint that investigators call a debris field. 
In the Oklahoma City bombing, we see uh, debris was blown out sideways from the face of the building from the explosion. The wreckage was thrown nearly 1,000 feet from the structure, forming a distinct pattern. But as Chung surveys the scene from Sampung, he notices one striking difference. The debris wasn't thrown outwards. The entire structure came straight down. The pattern of collapse and lack of other evidence rules out a terrorist bomb. For Chung, it's conclusive. An explosion would not have caused the building to collapse straight down in its entirety. The pattern of collapse also rules out a gas explosion. Now there's only one option left, and it could affect almost every large building in Seoul. Some kind of structural failure must have caused this disaster. There is so much damage that if it wasn't an explosion, there has to be something wrong with the design of the building or a mistake in its construction. The pressure is on Chung to solve this mystery. In recent months, a bridge collapsed without warning, and now a superstore has suffered a similar fate. How many other thousands of buildings and millions of lives are in danger? Has the rush to build in this booming economy left a terrible legacy behind? Chung begins a process of elimination. Is poor design to blame? The drawings used to build a superstore should reveal all. The drawings show the superstore was built using a technique called flat slab construction. Flat slab construction is a common way to build multi-story buildings. Concrete columns support the weight of each level and steel bars are cast inside each one for extra reinforcement. More steel is used inside the floor slabs to strengthen them. So far, all is well. I can find nothing strange from the drawings to suggest that poor design caused this disaster. Although there's nothing wrong with the basic concept, the architect's original drawings are only half the picture. To actually build a structure, an engineer calculates the size of the columns and slabs required, then feeds this information back into the final design. Trained investigators know that this last phase is where mistakes can be made. As Chung compares the engineer's calculations with the architect's drawings, he finds a disturbing discrepancy. I notice the diameter of the columns is reduced on the drawings. When I see this, I immediately know that something's seriously wrong. The columns needed to be 80 centimeters in diameter. On the drawings, there are only 60. The question now is how was the building actually constructed? Could it be a mistake on the drawing board? The only way for Chung to find out for sure is to go back to the scene and measure the actual columns. At the disaster site, he confirms his worst fears. The diameter of the columns has been reduced to 60 centimeters. It's disturbing, but it's not the answer to the mystery. Standard engineering practice would have ensured that the building was safe. Every building is designed to have a safety tolerance. We build in a margin of safety to protect the structure, but more importantly, to protect the people from harm. Sampung was engineered to be two and a half times stronger than needed. Even though the mix-up over the column dimensions reduced this by half, there was still a healthy safety margin. There must be something else. Chung orders his investigation team back to the disaster site to look for more clues. There, they find another error. The reinforcing steel bars that strengthen the concrete floor slabs are in the wrong place. 
They should be five centimeters from the top of the sled, but they're 10 centimeters. This tiny detail is of crucial importance. The repositioning of the steel by about five centimeters may not sound like very much to the layperson, but it's critical because the effect of lowering the steel is very much like making the slab thinner. This mistake weakens the slab by 20% at the most vital part of the building, the point where the floors connect to the columns and the stress is transferred to the ground. It's still not enough to cause collapse, but the errors are adding up. They point to a systematic disregard for building regulations. Chung directs the suspicion toward Sam Pung's managers, who all survived the collapse. South Korean law enables the prosecutor's office to arrest the owner, chief architect, CEO, and facilities executive under suspicion of professional negligence. Then, Professor Chung interrogates them. Talking to these witnesses was very important. I needed to understand the history of the complex. Chung discovers that the superstore was originally designed to have only four floors above ground. But halfway through construction, management decided they needed a fifth level for more space. The construction company refused, saying the structure wouldn't support another floor. The contractors were fired. Then, management hired its own in-house construction company to finish the job. A prime example of how commercial pressures in Seoul's booming economy take precedent over all other considerations. Next, Chung calls in the building's facility manager, Mr. Lee. He explains that the controversial fifth floor was originally conceived as a roller skating rink. But late in construction, management changed their minds again and wanted the floor to contain eight restaurants. In Korea, diners traditionally sit on the floor, so restaurants install floor heating. To fit this heating, the floor must be thickened, which adds to its weight. As soon as I knew the roller skating rink had been changed to a restaurant floor, I knew that the building was in trouble. Installing the floor heat must have put even more stress on the vital connections on the fifth floor. Mr. Lee confirms that they were under enormous stress. He had seen the cracks with his own eyes and had photos taken. Mr. Lee tells me about a problem on the morning of the collapse. A pillar in one of the restaurants had a crack around the base of it the size of a man's fist. By checking the plans, Chung places the cracks at column 5E in the Chun Wan restaurant. He can tell the slab has completely separated from the pillar, with only the reinforcing steel holding it together. He's getting closer, but even this isn't enough to explain the disaster that claimed so many lives. There is one factor that Chung can't ignore. The building stood for a full six years. Hundreds of thousands of people came and went, shopped and dined in its nearly eight acres of retail floor space. Something must have happened after the building was completed. Something that pushed it over the edge. There always exists a critical point. If you go beyond that point, the building collapses. Chung's team scrutinizes the building's history. It's painstaking work but even the slightest anomaly counts. Finally, Chung gets a lead. Two years before the collapse, three large air conditioning units on the roof were moved because neighbors on the east side complained that they were too noisy. This could be the link Chung's looking for. He interviews facility manager Mr. Lee again. 
The facility manager confirms the air conditioning towers were moved. He has photographs showing this. The photographs reveal cracks on the roof, but it's how the units were moved that grabs Professor Chung's attention. Mr. Lee tells me that the air conditioning units had been dragged across the roof. This is very worrying. This latest detail provides the key to exactly how the building collapsed. As a direct result, Professor Chung's investigation will call into question the safety of almost every building in South Korea. On Nat Geo. We now return to seconds from disaster. Investigator Lan Chong is on the verge of solving what caused the disaster at the Sampung department store. Two years before the collapse, three large air conditioning units were dragged across the roof. A terrible mistake that made the entire roof unstable. What's more, their weight, 15 tons each, overstressed the main supports. Column 5E seems to have been affected the most. But Chung still doesn't know what triggered the collapse on June 29th. The trigger is the final explanation of what happened. And it's most important in that it explains why the failure occurred when it did. One piece of evidence remains unresolved. Survivors reported that the department store was vibrating on the day it collapsed. Chung thinks he finally has the answer. During the course of two years, every time the air conditioning unit is turned on, it sends vibrations across the unstable roof and ricochets down to the fifth floor. Over time, the crack gets wider around column 5E until it hits breaking point. The cracked slab in the Chunwan restaurant can hold no more. It starts to crumble. That's where it started. That's where the crack got bigger and set off the progressive collapse. Now, by rewinding the events leading up to that fateful day, and by following the evidence uncovered during the extensive investigation, we can finally reveal how the Sanpung Superstore collapsed. 1993, two years before collapse, the Superstore's three air conditioning units are repositioned, put on rollers, and dragged across the roof. Cracks form in the roof slabs, and the main support columns are forced downward. Column 5E takes a direct hit, and cracks appear where the column meets the fifth floor. June 29, 1995. Less than eight hours to disaster. Facility manager Mr. Lee is called to the Chunwan restaurant to examine a large crack in the floor. Unknown to Mr. Lee, vibrations from the air conditioning units are radiating across the cracked roof and down through column 5E to where it connects to the fifth floor slab. The fracture in the Chunwan restaurant opens up. Five hours to disaster, and the first of several large bangs erupts from the fifth floor. The vibrations from the air conditioning units force the crack to widen even further. After reports that the entire building is vibrating, Mr. Lee turns off the air conditioning. But it's too late. The crack in the Chunwan restaurant has grown to 10 centimeters. 52 minutes to disaster. Sam Pung is packed with shoppers. 20 seconds before disaster, a massive boom sends shockwaves through the building. Panicked shoppers run for their lives. The fifth floor slab around column 5E finally gives way. In less than 20 seconds, the building crashes to the ground, trapping more than 1,500 people. Sixteen days after the collapse, the disaster site is nearly cleared. 
323 corpses have been recovered. But amazingly, beneath the rubble, one person is still alive. It's 19-year-old children's department assistant Park Sang-hyun. I hear loud machinery above my head and I think, this is it, I'm going to die. I start banging with all my might. The machines stop and I hear a voice call out, is anybody down there? Park has been trapped for 377 hours in complete darkness. Incredibly, apart from a few scratches, she is unscathed. All I could think is now I am saved. I am going to live. TV crews broadcast the event to a stunned nation. But no one is more shocked than So Hee Jin. It was incredible. Incredible. Even though everyone around me told me she was dead, only I kept on believing until the end. I couldn't stop crying. Park is rushed to the hospital, her eyes covered to protect them from the light they haven't seen for so long. Her best friend, So, helps nurse her back to health in the hospital. Although I suffered, I just think I am very lucky to have survived. After weeks of recovery, Park finally goes home. I feel so bad that So suffered so much. I really love her. Professor Chung's investigation blamed the collapse on human ignorance, negligence, and greed. On December 27, 1995, after months of public demonstrations, Jun Li, the owner of Sampung, was jailed for ten and a half years after being found guilty of criminal negligence. His son, the CEO, was jailed for seven years for corruption and accidental homicide. It is totally unacceptable that the Sampung department store collapsed. It was so unfortunate that so many mistakes were made in one building. Even if just one of the people involved had not made one of the mistakes, this disaster would never have happened. The final verdict had an enormous and lasting impact. Following further investigations, widespread corruption and fraud were discovered at Sampung. 21 others were found guilty, including 12 city officials. In the aftermath, rigorous government building inspections took place across the entire country. What they uncovered was beyond belief. One out of every seven high-rise structures needed rebuilding, and four out of five needed major repair work. In all, 98% of South Korea's buildings were affected, and just one in 50 was deemed safe. If there's one thing I take away from this, it's that if you build a building, build it for your family or those you love, with that mindset, this disaster would never have happened. A bustling department store in one of the largest cities in the world. 1,500 people are crowded inside. Suddenly, a huge shockwave erupts from the top floor. In less than 20 seconds, the entire store crashes to the ground. And all that remains is a massive pile of twisted steel and concrete. More than 500 people are dead. The tragedy stuns the nation, and the public demands answers. 
Now one man must find out what caused this catastrophe. What he discovers will shake an entire country to its foundation. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. South Korea. Several tragedies. Two gas explosions and a bridge collapse have killed nearly 150 people. In all three cases, poor building practices were to blame. In the aftermath, the nation starts to question the price of their economic growth. So the state puts into place a series of rigorous inspections for all public buildings to restore confidence. Sampung has just passed its regular safety inspection. 10.02 a.m. Park is already busy at work in the children's clothing department. Over in the household section, Yu Ji Wan is running late. This is her first job since leaving school. And like most teenagers, she'd much rather be doing something else. Being a sales assistant is boring. It's tiring standing for so many hours. Late 80s from reinforced concrete. The complex has four basement levels and five stories above ground. It stands on nearly four acres of real estate in the city's exclusive Kangnam district. The area was once a landfill site and the city's waste dump. Now it's one of Seoul's most affluent areas. 8.05 a.m. Young Cho Lee, the store's facility manager, starts his day. His first job is to investigate a note left on his desk by the nighttime security guard. In the early hours of the morning, the guard heard strange noises coming from the roof. The roof is cracked. But Lee knows that this was caused when air conditioning units were moved two years ago. Building safety is a major concern in South Korea. The country has recently been shocked by Seoul, 1995. It's a hot summer day in this booming capital city. In less than a decade, the country has transformed itself into one of the world's largest economies. The sudden wealth has led to a massive increase in construction. In Seoul, at least 10 high-rise buildings go up every week. But a shadow looms over this nation. Its neighbor, North Korea, lies just 25 miles from the capital. Close enough to put Seoul within range of artillery shells from one of the last surviving hardline communist countries. The relationship between the two has been violent for a long time. In 1983, North Korean militants detonated a bomb, killing 17 South Korean officials. Four years later, the communists are accused of destroying a South Korean airliner in flight, killing 115. June 29th, 7 a.m. Seoul's 10 million residents start another busy day. Among them is 19-year-old Park Seng Hyun. Park's dream is to be a school teacher. So to pay for her tuition, she works as a shop assistant. This evening, Park plans to meet her best friend, Sohee Jin. The two women have known each other since they were four. Park was like a sister to me. She was very outgoing and very kind. We had planned to meet in a coffee shop after she finished work. Park works in the Sampung Superstore, one of the most exclusive retail outlets in South Korea. 
The building employs 1,000 staff and serves 40,000 customers every day. It turns over the equivalent of 4 million US dollars a week and sells everything from the latest electronics to designer fashion. Built in